It's Meet the Writers from the Barnes & Noble studio on BN.com. I'm Steve Bertrand. On the day Al-Qaeda struck America while the rest of us stood dumbfounded and hugged our kids, a group of U.S. soldiers knew exactly what was going on and exactly what was coming next. They hugged their kids as well, but for a different reason. Doug Stanton has written their story in the book Horse Soldiers, and he joins us now. Doug, welcome. They knew, didn't they? And they knew what was coming. They, they did, and they'd never been used like this in any kind of uh, engagement the U.S. had been involved in. And the, the moment they turned on the radio, just like we did, and heard the towers falling, the guys said, you know what, I think we're going to go to Afghanistan. And it, it, what struck me about that was that they, even though they knew where they were going or what was happening, the intelligence that they had and even the equipment that they had was really lacking. It, it, it was, but this is a story about guys who like to do an awful lot with very little. I mean, they're they're in their they're in their rooms preparing to go, and they get a cardboard box of, of videotapes about travel shows about Afghanistan. That comprises some of their intelligence. They learned a lot more later, but really, special forces thrives on on in this kind of like have your back against the wall environment. So starting with very little and making the most right. of what you have, uh, a, a number of harrowing experiences that you write about, but, but it starts. Just with the helicopter journey into Afghanistan. Right. I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad you liked that scene because th- these are the same helicopters that flew, or the pilots, or the regiment in Black Hawk Down. And I thought that what they they work in such secrecy, and they and for a week I spent uh, at their headquarters. They let me look around, and I interviewed mm-hmm. the pilots. And just getting into this this country was almost a war in and of itself. Through the mountains, yeah. through this mysterious sort of meteorological event which was a sand and snowstorm at once called the yeah the blob they the call blob it they, they, they would nick- have to fly through <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they're flying at 17,000 feet the doors are open everyone's freezing and they don't really know what's going to happen when they land because the guys the special forces soldiers from 5th group special forces are told that they may not come back from this mission alive so when the helicopters take off they're now alone it's 12 Americans they're our response to 911 and thus the journey begins. And they are on the ground waiting for people to come out of hiding. Right. Not knowing if they're going to be friend or foe. Right, exactly. The CIA is already there. They're there early with uh, uh, some money and some aid. And their their early job, and an important job, was to get all these warring uh, factions pointed in one direction against the Taliban. And their message was, you do that, and these other guys, the horse soldiers, are going to come, and they're going to help you fight the Taliban. The, when the U.S. forces landed, they didn't know horses would be waiting for them. No. They knew very little, but least of all that, when they asked who, who's ridden before, you know, two guys raised their hand and had been as kids in county fairs from back in the Midwest. And so they're on these horses then tracking the Taliban. Exactly. What strikes me, too, uh, because you think you know. Right, and then you read a book like this, and you realize what you don't know. Right, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, "We don't know what we don't know." <laughs> right, uh, but the warlord is it pronounced Dostum? Correct. Uh, was very different from my picture of an Afghan warlord. Hmm. I mean, he's on a satellite telephone talking to members of Congress, talking to reporters across the world, and then talking to Taliban forces across the valley. Mm-hmm. We, there's a great deal of drama and kind of page turning, uh, uh, pulse. Uh, uh, pounding stuff in this book yeah. but there's also humor because Dostum is on his walkie-talkie and they're dropping bombs on the Taliban which is what the Americans bring to this and the tele- they, they would bicker back and forth and they would say ha ah, you missed us and tell Tal- Dostum would say well by how much and they say well about 200 meters to our left so of course then they corrected for that and then the next time they were successful but the Taliban did not really realize what kind of technological um, giant they were facing when the Americans landed and so this Dostum for as wily as he is, what makes what might be a fatal mistake, right, when he gets a number of Taliban to surrender, right, and he brings them back to uh, Mazari Sharif, where Correct. where they almost take retake the city. They do, and, and this comprises about the last third of the book, because this is a story about these very small number of U- uh, U.S. soldiers winning, I mean, literally ousting right. the Taliban from the country. All seems to be well, and then Finally, in the third act, the action turns, and 600 Taliban soldiers come in in a Trojan horse maneuver, get back into the the captured city. They try to break out of this mud fortress. And I was talking with uh, Colonel Mark, now Colonel Mark Mitchell, uh, and he said, you know, we had uh, 13 guys to ke- to to keep these 600 prisoners uh, inside this fortress, and if they had lost it. What's so um, unbelievable about the story is that the whole northern part of the, the country would have been in jeopardy again because this was a key city to, to own. Mm-hmm. There are some 
interesting things about culture. When these Taliban surrender, uh, the, the Afghan soldiers don't fully search them no. because of cultural concerns. When, the, when they're shooting, they don't always aim exactly at the men they're shooting at. Correct. Because of this response. Explain for me the responsibility for their souls. Well, if you, um, if you kind of shoot in the general direction of your enemy and he happens to be hit by this bullet, then it was meant to be. And if uh, and and uh, so therefore uh, his soul is not on, on your uh, uh, you know on your on your ledger not, uh, on your ledger yeah. yeah so it's called pray and spray and um, it's just but it's generally though just a matter of lack of training and what the Americans brought to this was to get all these I mean if we want to think about it a moment this is a little bit like uh, like World War II when these Americans have gone in behind enemy lines to gather up the locals to fight the ruling class, which in this case was the Taliban, not the Nazis. And so they didn't really have a lot of military skills that they brought to bear to begin with. Well, the, you mentioned Mark Mitchell. This certainly is his story. It's, it's Mike Spann's story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's also John Walker Lind's story. Right. Lind was among those Taliban who surrendered and was brought back to Mazar-e Sharif. It, he is. He's, he, you know, my editor, Colin Harrison, said that if uh, Norman Mailer were writing this, that Lind in some way would be the me a meta character in that he represents both these incredibly naive impulses, but also these other uh, impulses that are born out of a young person, I think, studying about the Taliban, but not really connecting the dots. And it, he, he, he claimed in, in, in reports and so on that he didn't understand that the Taliban were fighting America. And in fact, when he went overseas, that, that was the case. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, he then now is in the crosshairs of history, and he's caught. And he's in this fortress being held, along with hundreds right. of others, in the basement of a building called the Pink House. Right. They're, the Taliban are down there. They're, they're, the revolt is underway. And even after it's suppressed, there are a number of people still in the basement of this building. Right. And they try to drown them out. Well, I don't know if they're trying to drown them, but they're trying to move them because they've tried shooting, fire, uh, almost anything to get it. And it turns out there are 86 people still alive in this basement. So, and actually, when I went to Afghanistan for the research, I met Ali Sarwar, one of the subcommanders, who dug a trench across the, the field of the fortress and began to flood this basement. Mm -hmm. So this cold water is rising to the ceiling. In fact, I could still see the water mark, and it was uh, quite high. Right. And so they're floating around in this, this uh, awful environment, and that's finally what convinces them to surrender and give up. And w the world is amazed, finally, to number one, to see Lind and to realize that so many people are still alive. This small... Quick strike force mm -hmm. was, in many ways, Donald Rumsfeld's idea, mm -hmm. and it was successful. Was the success of the horse soldiers, did that make it easier for the U.S. to then go into Iraq a couple years later? I don't think it made it easier. I mean, and some just by the way, some of the credit, a lot of the credit needs to go to now General Mulholland, John Mulholland, and General, uh, General Jeffrey Lambert at the time at, at, at Fort Bragg and Fort Campbell, because they pushed, because never before in the history of the U.S. had the Special Forces been used as a lead element. They did what they did uh, was so quick and inexpensive that uh, later on in Iraq, some of these same guys uh, did amazing things. We just never read about them, but they did very similar things as in as in the book. I just wondered if the U.S. might have been a little drunk with success because of oh, what happened in Afghanistan. No, I don't think no. so because okay. it's a very different fight. I mean. We didn't have a plan uh, when 9-11 when happened, so these guys are actually plan B, but they became plan A very quickly and the right plan. As we know, Iraq was a much more large-scale invasion. Very poignant part of the story as well are the soldiers we meet who survived mm -hmm. in Afghanistan only to die a short time later in Iraq. And I'm thinking of the young blonde man. His name was Brett, was it? Uh, Brett Walden, right. yes. Yeah, um, I remember uh, talking with Brett, and I was when I was wor working on the book, I, I always um, with trepidation was looking at the news to see who might, who might die in Iraq, and Brett was unfortunately one of those, um, you know. And often they they had this this battle was so uh, amazing and and wild in so many ways because they were just told to go, and fight the Taliban, and they survived it, and not a single guy. Um, well, some, some were hurt by a bombing later on, but they all lived. Right. And uh, then in Iraq, through other kinds of circumstances, kind of less dramatic, non-combative in some cases, um, they, did, they did perish. Doug Stanton, the name of the book, Horse Soldiers. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. I'm Steve Bertrand. You're watching Meet the Riders from the Barnes & Noble studio on BN.com.